Hi, everyone. I am Jason Morgan, editor of Fleet Equipment, and welcome to Fleet Equipment Unscripted, the video interview series that connects you with the top minds in the industry. Today, I have Dave Walters, senior solutions engineer, and Ronaldo Adler, industry principal of TMT, both from Trimble Transportation. Gentlemen, thanks for joining us. Dave, how uh, is your work from home transition going over there? Awesome. Loving it every day, staying out of the airports and the airplanes. So it's been a positive experience so far for me. How about you, uh, Ronaldo? It's a, it's a change. You know, I spend a lot of my time on airplanes and traveling, just like Dave. So it is a change, you know, kind of grasping the new technology and making sure that you know, people can get off mute on the other end of the phone and stuff has been fun. But it's going good. Yeah, a lot so of miles in the car. Yeah, for sure. Save here. I was. Uh, that's re actually the reason I called you because after day two of this work from home thing, I got cabin fever and had to start seeing everyone because I couldn't travel. So I appreciate you uh, letting me add to your video conference call agenda, <laughs> which I'm sure is heavy. <laughs> Glad to be here. Great. Okay, so today we're talking squarely about uh, service, truck service, keeping trucks on the road given the current climate. Um, you know, service is always important, but maybe today it feels a little. Uh, extra important, uh, maybe the stakes are higher, the attention's greater. Um, we wanna make sure we can provide information uh, to help our fleet readers stay on the road as much as possible. So Dave, I'll start with you with the first question here. Sure. Uh, from Trimble's uh, point of view, what are the most common service issues that'll put a truck on the side of the road? Hasn't really changed um, over the years. We kind of like to call them the big three, BLT, brakes, lights, and tires still remain probably the most common reasons that vehicle go out of service or break down um, along the side of the road. Uh, followed closely um, nowadays by engine related sensors, um, particularly around the exhaust system, diesel particulate filters and other engine related um, sensors on vehicles. So those seem to be the common threads that we see um, with vehicles on the side of the road and vehicles requiring um, service. Very cool, Ronaldo, any uh, additional thoughts there? It sounds like Dave covered it pretty well. Yeah, he's, he's pretty much right on. The other one is around cooling, the, you know, more cooling problems. But from a, from a mechanical standpoint, I don't think the trucks are breaking down like they used to. It's not the mechanical breakdown. A lot of it is technology, with all the new technology going on there with the DEFs problems until we get all those kinks worked out of the app. The regen, you know, sometimes those drivers don't pay attention to the regens and so forth. So that's down again more than it needs to. For sure. Uh, and brakes, lights, tires, that all sounds like uh, maintenance, inspection, preventative maintenance stuff you can catch. Uh, you know. So let's start there. Uh, Dave, what are those top, uh, those top inspection and preventative maintenance points that everyone definitely needs to stay on top of today? I think the key is the daily vehicle pre and post trip inspections that drivers are required and should be performing, you know, on a regular basis. I think having a solid process there, having, you know, drivers trained in um, items that they should be looking for, for and identifying when they do those pre trip and post trip inspections are mission criticals, primarily around tires, trying to catch nails and tires, things like that, which ultimately are going to cause catastrophic failures you know a little bit later on so i think it all begins with that daily vehicle inspection process transitions to the standard pm schedules that fleets will apply to an asset so how often are we going to bring it into the shop for service where we do the deep dive and the deep inspection of that asset we may plug into engine ecms and download fault codes and performance information you know, on a piece of equipment. So a combination of those two performed well can eliminate a lot of opportunities for breakdowns um, over the road. For sure. Ronaldo, any uh, follow-up thoughts? Yeah, Dave, Dave's right. You know, the, the looking at the truck before it hits the road, that can save a lot of things. And with the new technology on the trucks, you know, there's the this whole world around predictive maintenance or predictive analytics, taking that sensor data coming off that truck and trying to predict when is my DEF going to you know, light up or when is this sensor going to go out or so forth. So there's a lot of people doing analyzing the signal data coming off the truck itself and trying to say, 
Now here's a pattern we're seeing if you have a voltage spike or drop here, plus all these other conditions, there's a probability that you're gonna have a failure. We've done some stuff around that too, trying to predict it. Um, there's, uh, there's some challenges, you know, there, the easier ones are more around the wearable items, you know, predicting that one-off failure is really hard because you need a lot of data to make those predictions. And then you have the problem of, you know, so we've predicted that this part's gonna fail. Now you go back to the OEM and say, well, you know, Tremble says this part's gonna fail, I replaced it. Are you gonna cover it under warranty? Well, right. everybody can guess what the OEM is gonna say. Well, it didn't break, so we're not paying for it. So that's one of the, the challenges in that whole realm of doing predictive analytics. I think in the future, it's gonna keep building more data or better quality of data, so there'll be better predictions. The other sure. important part of that is that we're also working with is not only the predictive part, but the prescriptive. You know, um, just because I predicted it, what was done to fix that problem? Well, I replaced the voltage meter or sensor or something, you know, and getting that data back to the people who are on the analytics, so now they can say, Here's what we're seeing. Here's what we think is wrong. But here's the part that you need to replace, or what we think you need to replace, and then have that probability. Right, for sure. And that kind of leads. Go ahead. No, go I was going to say that leads kind of into my next next couple of questions in regard to using that data to improve your service. Right, predictive is great. We know it's coming down the line, but uh, using data to improve the service process from you know, bay throughput to increase it or to, to decreasing service times, even just kind of knowing what the stock, right? If you're running your own maintenance thing, uh, maintenance facility. Yeah, so having, but, that, uh, oh, go ahead. Yeah, having that information available, here's the part that, that you may need to use. And the thing that people have to understand, you know, the, the predictive side, one of the, the best things you can have is the prediction to actually, you know, you not listen to the prediction and then the part fail because that proves out that the prediction is right. If we predict that uh, something's going to fail and you replace that part, well, you never knew for sure that that part was going to fail. You, you never were able to prove it exact. And then you have the, the other two extremes where we predict something and it doesn't happen. So you have the, the negative, negative, and the positive, positive. You know, so you have to look at all those variables and it's just a prediction. So if it's 80% probability that it's going to fail, well, there's 20% of the time we're going to be wrong. But if you can build it into your already existing maintenance schedule and it falls in line with there and it's not another uh, additional time in a bay, then it, it's all good. Uh, exactly. Um, and, and, and I know, so you have, the, you have the predictive, prescriptive. Dave, I know you mentioned a lot of engine sensor data, a lot of engine data coming off uh, uh, the trucks within the telematics platform. So maybe even at a base level, right? Say I, I'm a fleet, I'm working with a, a contract service provider. Uh, it's someone I work with a lot. Is there is there, is there some kind of data or, or, or information that I can share in a safe and secure way with my service provider to, to streamline that process? Sure, and I think, you know, I think we've touched on a couple of those, but when we're using an outside service provider who doesn't have access to the detail on the asset, previous repair history is mission critical, right? So if we've worked on that system on a vehicle before or that component on the vehicle in the past, being able to readily get access to that data, share that information with the service provider, we now are in a chronic repair situation. So if it's the sixth time we've adjusted the brakes on this trailer in the last 120 days, that's meaningful information. So a simple brake adjustment isn't fixing the problem, we have a bad slack adjuster. So having that repair history and that perspective and sharing that with the vendor performing the repair work can be mission critical to finally getting a resolution um, to the issue. Warranty, right, again, having warranty information available. Is the system or the component on the vehicle under warranty? If so, who is the vendor that we should look to um, push that work to? Uh, hopefully they would be trained to do that type of repair work, have parts and inventory to do those types of repairs. So warranty can be a, cr a critical component to selecting um, the right vendor. And then last, and Ronaldo had kind of touched on this, is parts identification, right? So 
if we're going to select a vendor and push work into a vendor or dealer, calling ahead, saying, hey, we may have an alternator problem. Do you have a Delco 34 SI alternator in stock? If not, can you get a hold of one? Because I have a truck coming your way and, and there's a good chance we're going to need to replace that component on the vehicle. So I think those are three critical pieces of information that a typical vendor wouldn't have that we could provide if our maintenance system can support um, that type of effort. For sure. And it sounds like that is, uh, you want a visibility that integrates all that other stuff, right? Like you have all the, the equipment data, but now you need to match that up to what you've done previously, where our, those are repair orders, purchase orders, service costs, uh, the warranty information. You want to make sure that you have a platform that can do that or have it available. Right? Exactly, exactly. Ronaldo, any thoughts there in, in that lineup? Yeah, you know, Dave is exactly right from the from the initial start. You know, here's what's going on with the truck. It shows up with service provider. Give them as much information that, that we can give them so they can fix the truck. The other very important piece that people forget is we need to get that data back. What did you do to fix that truck? And it needs to get back in the system because if you're not getting detail of what that service provider did to fix that part, if it was just, you know, replace the part, he doesn't give you the part number or the alternator or any of that information. Well, now your history is incomplete. So the next time that thing fails, you're going to be giving incomplete information to the next person. So upfront is very important, but the return of that detailed data back to the fleet so they get a complete picture of that repair is just as important because it breaks down if you don't have that the whole process just falls apart no that's a great point it seems like that would be on the, the onus on the fleet to one make sure they get that data right the or information the service provider should be able to provide it but then also enter it in a system where the data makes sense and it's in the right format right always the challenge in an ideal world, we're able to send that information electronically to the service provider. They key in that unit number. It says, here's the repairs. Oh, there was an alternator replaced, you know, three days ago, three months ago. And then when they finish that work, they put in the note. It wasn't the alternator. It was something else. and sends that data back to the fleet. In the, in the ideal state, they're not double key and having to do that after work. It just flows through the... Uh, APIs that go back and forth between them. For sure. In a, in a more, so, so that's kind of an advanced case, right? When you're, especially when you're working with an outside provider and making sure that, that there's integration with the APIs that you mentioned. But what if, what if I have my own maintenance facilities, right? Maybe I just stay on top of my PMs. Are there any specific uh, like tra uh, technician training, technician management, uh, kind of feedback loops to make sure um, the data is getting input correctly on my shop floor? Dave, you have any thoughts there? Sure. I mean, data input is always the critical piece, right? So we try to build systems. The TMT system actually puts that process in the technician's hands. So their work assignments are through either a tablet or a kiosk in the shop. They have access to the complete repair history um, of that particular vehicle. They'll be alerted to warranty status on the vehicle. When they go to replace a, a part, it may be under an aftermarket parts warranty. So we alert the technician and automatically build the warranty core tag for the part that's coming off the vehicle. So, you know, the mechanic experience and getting them involved in the data collection process is mission critical, right? And they do just an extraordinarily good job of collecting data and get it, getting it properly entered um, into the system. From a training standpoint, if I were running my own shops today, I would be focusing on engine diagnostics the ability to interpret fault code information and engine ECM data. ABS brake systems continue to be challenging. And again, there's an ECM involved interpreting fault codes that come from ABS brake systems. Uh, and then obviously just parts inventory to support those efforts. What are the common repairs? Um, obviously fleets are running a lot of miles these days in the current environment you know, maintaining our PM schedules and making sure that the parts to support the PM program are always in inventory. So I should never have a truck come in for a PM service and not have a filter available. So I think those are some mission critical things that I think are 
all of our shops are focusing on today, they're challenged with. So our goal as a TMT maintenance system is to support that effort and make it easier and simpler um, for that process. So, For sure, well stated. Uh, Ronaldo, what do you think? Uh, you know, Dave, you know, the one thing that makes a lot of that work is really the ATA, the VMRS code. So everybody's speaking the same language. Right? So that alternator is, you put on brand X today and brand Y today. How does the system know it was an alternator? Key to that is to be a mask code. So each alternator is one code for alternators. So we can tell that the same part is being replaced, even though it's a different part number, different manufacturer. And then you know, we can track warranty off of that. We can do the predictive analytics that we're talking about in the prescriptive information because we have to have a unique key to identify an alternator. So that is the, the key part of the system is to have everybody speaking the same language. So your shop versus another one of your shops, if they don't have the same codes and the same process, it's not going to work. And then when you go to an outside service provider, it gets even more complicated because they may not put the same code in there and then everything falls back again. So ATA VMRS code is a huge key to tying all this together. And you know, from a technician standpoint and the service manager, the ATA has a certification program that you can take and go through a short little class and there's a test at the end. You can be a certified VMRS specialist, which uh, really helps people understand the codes. And it's more than just the part, the VMRS code for the part what the system assembly part is, but you also have things that get into the reason for repair and so forth. So you can start analyzing your data. As you start doing more analytics across it, you want some common language. Because if I had a part that was replaced because of an accident versus a failure, I don't want the accident messing up my calculations. You know, or you decided to replace it just because you didn't like it or something. Need all these codes to really get meaningful data back out. Yeah, no, for sure. And I, I know that we've worked uh, closely with uh, you and the folks at Trimble to do stories on that. I will actually link those stories uh, in this in this post below, and I'll link I'll dig up the the specialist training link as well because it is it always amazes me how really you know forward forward-looking VMRS was and how really powerful it is. I mean, it's been around forever, but now the power that you can really put into it with these platforms is amazing. Yeah, I, I don't want to date myself, but you know, that was around <laughs> before I started working on this. So 35 years ago, they were building those VMRS codes and they just keep evolving where now you have to have them for the electric trucks and yeah. all these other things on there and they just keep growing. But uh, it was a good design that, uh, People that started that really did a good job on it. And For sure. It's a great foundation that hasn't really changed. For sure. Um, for sure. Very impressive. Well, that's all the time we have today. I want to thank you both for uh, taking the time to talk. Really great info, and I'm sure we will talk again soon. Yes. Thank you, Jason.